So let's start with the incidence of exocrine insufficiency. Um, and I've taken surgical data because there isn't data on pancreatic cancer specific to the site of the cancer. And the one thing that's important about the pancreas is the function of the pancreas is not the same across the whole gland. So the head of the pancreas has more exocrine function cells, the tail of the pancreas has more islet cells. So if you have a distal pancreatectomy, so the tail of your pancreas removed, you're much more likely to be diabetic, much less likely to have exocrine insufficiency. If you have the head of your pancreas removed or disease in the head of your pancreas, you're more likely to have exocrine insufficiency, you're less likely to be diabetic. So although this data is specific to surgery, that's because we can quantify the areas of the pancreas that's removed, but I believe that the, um, the data can be carried across to inoperable pancreatic cancer patients depending on the site of their disease as well. So let's look at distal pancreatectomy. Um, so when you do a literature search for this, all sorts of weird and wonderful papers come up. Um, the big issue with it, as Keith mentioned earlier on, we don't have a good test for exocrine insufficiency. Um, can I have a show of hands, those of you whose hospitals use faecal elastase? Uh, about half. Anybody using coefficient of fat absorption or three-day fat tests? No one at all. Okay, anybody using the breath test? Carbon-13 breath test? No. Okay, so those are the three methods we have in the UK at the moment. Um, so there's less than half of those of you represented here that are using any method at all. And this is the problem we have with pancreas. When you go back, when I first qualified, we um, used to use pancreal laurel assays. We don't do that anymore. Uh, Fecal fats are... Have, the BSG has deemed them not appropriate for diagnosis purposes, although we believe they're very helpful for monitoring purposes. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. And there's all sorts of other tests, fecal uh, chymotrypsin, which is not available in the UK. Um, a lot of authors use the prescription of PERT um, as, a, as a marker as to whether pancreatic enzyme exocrine insufficiency is present or not. But that just tells us whether anyone has treated it, not whether it's there. Um, so that's not very helpful. Uh, onset of steatorrhea, um, there's a belief that um, when less than 10% of the pancreatic uh, tissue is remaining, um, that at that stage steatorrhea will occur. And um, there's a very recent uh, article just published in the World Journal of Gastroenterology which disputes that we don't have that level of data at the moment. And again, steatorrhea is a very vague symptom. Um, you have to be able to, you have to be eating fat in order to malabsorb it. So a patient on a low-fat diet won't get steatorrhea. Um, and a patient who's hardly eating anything won't get steatorrhea. Um, so again, not great um, uh, methods of, of establishing exocrine insufficiency. But that aside, um, if you look at the preoperative patient groups, it uh, varies significantly in the region of 16 to 65%. Um, and in the postoperative group, anything up to 80% of patients just uh, show signs of exocrine insufficiency. It's a massive variation, and that's because a distal pancreatectomy varies significantly from patient to patient with how much pancreatic tissue is removed um, and what test you use. So it's not really very helpful data. When you look at central pancreatectomy, so the centre part of the pancreas being removed leaves the head um, intact and plums the tail onto a loop of bowel, um, there's much less data out there. Um, uh, with tiny studies showing no patients um, and a, a systematic review showing an incidence of about 12%. Um, but it doesn't say at what time, whether that's post-op, pre-op, six months down the line, a year down the line. We know that after surgery, the pancreas can atrophy with time. So patients who uh, may not have symptoms to begin with may develop them a year or so down the line. Uh, so not having a time frame on here means that we can't really specify uh, an incidence from this. Now, the Whipple's resection, or um, pylorus preserving pancreatic duodenectomy, much more data on and much more consistent data. So the vast majority of these tests use faecal elastase. Um, this trial here, um, you'll see this is the same author, it's the same paper, um, and they've used two tests and looked at the differences between the two, and you can see that there is some difference there um, with higher incidences apparent in those patients with the faecal elastase compared to those where steatorrhea itself has been uh, assessed, so the actual uh, amount of fat that's not absorbed. Now, we need to bear in mind that the pancreas is not the only area of the body that produces lipase, um, so fat absorption may not necessarily be directly proportionate to pancreatic function. So, in the preoperative setting, you're looking in the region of 20 to 45%. 
and that's consistent with the data we see in our units. And post-operatively, anything up to 98%. Um, and as Keith mentioned earlier, uh, different units do different things. In our hospital, we routinely supplement with enzymes after a Whipple, all patients, and actually we start it preoperatively at the point they present with obstructive jaundice um, in order to prevent some of the malnutrition that we see in these patients. Um, we have a, uh, one of our surgeons has a great theory on it, um, which we may have helped develop over the last few years, um, which is if a patient is going to have exocrine insufficiency, they're going to develop malnutrition. Um, you don't want to wait for that to happen in a patient who's about to undergo major surgery. If we give them enzymes and they don't need it, six months down the line when they're healed and they're well and they're having the chemotherapy and their weight's stable and they're doing really well, that's the point to think about do they need to come off their enzymes or can they stay on them? Not at the point where they're post-op with three new joins, a big open wound, they're not eating well. That's not the time to play around with enzyme function in these patients. So, big variation. Be careful when you look at the studies. Um, so you'll see changes in the patient numbers as they go through that may give an apparent increase or an apparent decrease. Um, some of our patients don't live very long after this operation, unfortunately, and the patients with more severe disease may have excluded themselves from the study or passed away. Um, so changes in time can only be interpreted if you've got consistent patient group. So the same number of patients that are followed up throughout the time, you need to exclude the patients that, that, that fall off because they're likely to have more severe disease. Okay, so a range of, of, of um, incidences. But there's more causes for pancreatic exocrine insufficiency than simply how much pancreas has been removed. That is the first thing. The more pancreas you remove, the more likely your patient is to have exocrine insufficiency. Um, but also there's a lack of stimulation of the pancreas. So the pancreas is stimulated by taste and smell of food, gastric dilatation, and change in pH in the duodenum, so that delivery of partially digested foods into the small bowel. So when you have a patient who has a pancreatic duodenectomy, it's a clue in the word, they remove the duodenum. Um, so you don't see that, that, that main stimulation of the pancreas. Um, pancreatic duodenectomy takes two forms. You either have a pylorus preserving or a couch whipple. And the couch whipple involves removing the distal part of the stomach as well. So you reduce the amount of acid, you reduce gastric dilatation. Um, so there are lots of other issues. We then give our patients medication um, that inhibits their pancreas as well. After this resection, the pancreas is plumbed onto a loop of bowel that's about 30 centimetres away from the base of the stomach. And food does not travel through that loop of bowel. It's what we call a blind loop. Um, so it means when food empties down into the stomach, pancreatic juices and bile probably follow behind. They're not mixing in the same way that they would do normally because they've got 30 centimetres of bowel to travel through before they get to the bottom of the stomach to mix with food. And I'll show you a diagram that will explain that a bit better in a minute. And that's what we call asynchrony of enzyme delivery, and that occurs for both bile and pancreatic juice. We don't have a normal postprandial cholecystokinin release, which is responsible for activating our enzymes. And again, that's because the duodenum's been removed. Um, the duct itself um, has been stitched into the bowel, so the pancreatic duct um, Keith was talking about earlier. Um, and you can get inflammation, you can get stricturing, you can get edema of that. So the remaining pancreas may not be able to have a flow of juices anyway, particularly in the early pancreatic uh, early post-operative period with edema and everything going on. And in the long term, that's when you tend to see the strictures. <coughs> There's also a significant change in gut pH. The pancreas, as well as producing digestive enzymes and insulin, also produces bicarbonate. Um, so when you've got an alteration in the flow of bile because it's, up, it's draining in through this limb, um, you've got less bicarbonate secretion. We've put the patient on PPIs to try and compensate for that. Um, we've used medications like octreotide that switch off GI secretions. You see a big change in gut pH. And enzymes are pH sensitive. So pancreatic enzymes require a en uh, pH of 5.5 for op optimal activation. Um, so if we're changing the pH of the gut, we're going to change the availability of those enzymes as well. There are a few other considerations. So this is the paper I mentioned earlier which looks at faecal elastase versus coefficient of fat absorption. And coefficient of fat absorption, for those of you not familiar with it, very old-fashioned test where patients were given 100 grams of fat 
um, diet consistently for a five-day period. And on the last three days, the th uh, stool samples were collected for the whole of the three days. Now, for those of you who remember this, and I did a project in cystic fibrosis as part of my degree, um, where we had to collect these samples, big pots, <laughs> three days' worth of fecal matter deposited on the dietician's desk. It's great fun. Um, we don't do that test anymore, sadly. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, but what it showed was that if you had a patient who had a coefficient of fat absorption of less than 93%, that meant they had uh, more than 7 grams of fat a day were being lost in the stool, which is the diagnosis, the cutoff for exocrine insufficiency. 91% um, of them also had a low fecal elastase. So that looks fairly good. But if you take the ones with normal fat absorption, 65% of them had a low fecal elastase. Um, so Again, we need to bear in mind that we're testing different things. So the coefficient of fat absorption is testing how much fat you absorb. Fecal elastase is testing how much enzymes your pancreas secretes, and they're not the same thing. So you have salivary lipase, you have gastric lipase, you have other areas in your body that produce enzymes to break down fat. Elastase itself is a protease, it's not a lipase, um, and it reminds us that the pancreas breaks down protein and carbohydrates as well. Um, as fat. It's not just all about fat in these patients, and I can't, can't stress that enough for those of you who've heard me talk before. I know it's one of my biggest bugbears that pancreas is only associated with fat digestion. It's really not. So, when we look at our enzymes, just to recap on what I've just said, um, we have other sources of lipase. We have some intestinal lipase in our brush borders as well. Um, our proteases are spread, again, through the stomach, the pancreas, and the, and the brush borders. What we're quite interested in um, is the carbohydrate side of things. So the pancreas produces a huge amount of amylase, and that's what the surgeons measure in the drains when they're worried about a leak, because um, we can measure that in drain fluid. Um, below the pancreas, we only have disaccharidases. Okay? So we cannot digest polysaccharides below the pancreas. We have no source of amylase. Okay? So we're going back to GCSE biology. Um, so you imagine your pancreatic patient, they've had a total pancreatectomy, and they've got delayed gastric emptying afterwards, so we've stuck an NG tube down, we've drained out all of their gastric secretions and any saliva that they've swallowed. So we're working below here. Um, so we have no way of breaking down normally um, starchy carbohydrates, and most enteral feeds are based on starchy carbohydrates. So we have a little bit of a problem, and I'll talk about a compensatory mechanism for that in a minute. Um, but we can still do a small amount of lipases and proteases, but peptide absorption and MCT absorption is much better um, than long-chain triglycerides and whole proteins in this patient group. So we have some compensatory mechanisms, and they mainly associate with carbohydrate. So about 10% of your total energy um, can be salvaged by colonic fermentation of carbohydrates into short-chain fatty acids, which the colon can absorb. Now, in the long-term, community patient, that's fine. Um, we can still access quite a lot of that energy, um, but it causes bloating, it causes distension, and causes lots of wind and flatulence. It's unpleasant. It's reversed by pancreatic enzymes. Think into the immediate post-operative setting in the critical care environment. If you have a patient who becomes bloated and distended post-operatively, what happens to the feed? Get stopped. Um, with a differential being ischemic gut and ileus and all sorts of other things. So we do need to have in the back of our head that actually some of the absorption of these feeds is impaired really at the early stage. There are animal studies showing compensatory mechanisms in response to both gastric and intestinal enzyme secretion as well, but it's not enough. We need to remember the role of the duodenum, which I alluded to earlier on, not only in terms of its stimulation of the pancreas, by a variety of different um, in, uh, intestinal hormones. Um, and it, it's a mechanism in terms of cholecystokinin release, um, which stimulates blood flow in the postprandial phase. So that will affect the whole of digestion, not just the flow of the pancreas. So um, it, it's got a control mechanism to mesenteric blood flow. I talked about it stimulating the pancreas. It also stimulates the rest of those digestive enzymes and biliary flow. So contraction of the gallbladder as well. Um, and the duodenum itself plays a key role in nutrient absorption. Um, so it's really important that we remember that, particularly from a micronutrient point of view. 
Vitamin and mineral absorption occurs primarily in the duodenum and the proximal jejunum. And I mentioned earlier on there's a blind loop of jejunum after this um, surgery, and that, that can take up to 30, sometimes more, centimetres of the proximal jejunum and take it out of continuity with the gut, so we can't use it for vitamin and mineral absorption, which is why we see so many vitamin and mineral deficiencies in these patients. So what about the benefits of enzyme therapy? Um, we know it prevents long-term vitamin and mineral deficiencies, and we see these vitamin and mineral deficiencies, vitamin A deficiency, night blindness. We've had a number of cases of that. Um, we've had vitamin E um, deficiency with neuropathy um, and all sorts of other things. The Armstrong studies in Southampton looked at selenium and iron and other, other trace elements. There's a relatively getting old data now, um, not from this country, but the only data I can find looking at readmissions um, associated entirely with malnutrition and dehydration running at nearly 38% after a pancreatic resection. That's a hard, huge number of, mal of readmissions. Um, and this is the study that, um, uh, that Keith mentioned earlier on about the chronic pancreatitis patients showing enzymes uh, was an independent risk factor uh, for survival. SPAC studies, for those of you working in oncology, looking at the chemotherapy options for patients, um, we know from that data that patients need to complete the full chemotherapy regime. The problem we have with exocrine insufficiency, patients lose weight, they become malnourished, and their performance status drops. And often those patients will then be taken off their chemotherapy. So when we do have regimes where we can potentially give them a few more months, sometimes longer, um, but their nutritional status is so poor that unfit for chemotherapy, um, we're going to have a, a link with outcome and survival as well. So there's lots of benefits. So how much do we give? If I, if I could answer this question, I'd retire. Um, we can't answer this question as it stands at the moment. As Keith alluded to earlier, generally speaking, we don't give enough. Um, but how do we know how much to give? We don't have a good method of assessing it. Do we know when we're giving enough? Not very easily. Um, this is data from our unit, um, which uh, looks at patients who were nutritionally well. And we consider nutritionally well as appropriate weight for their oral intake. We get a lot of patients referred in for more enzymes because they're losing weight. Um, and if they're eating well and losing weight, then yes, absolutely. But if they're not eating, no matter how many enzymes I give them, they're not going to gain weight. Um, so it needs to be proportionate to what they're eating. And this is where we as dietitians really come on board. If the patient's weight is not proportionate to their oral intake, we need to be thinking mal malnutrition, uh, malabsorption. So these patients had um, resolution of almost normal bowel function, good nutritional status, and increasing vitamin and mineral levels. And we measure fat-soluble vitamins and trace elements in all of our patients. We divided them up into those who had acute or chronic pancreatitis, um, those who had pylorus preserving pancreatic duodenectomy, and those who had a full couch whipple. So those patients don't have the bottom part of their stomach either. Um, and the data statistically was no different between the group. Um, the average dose was 266,000 units of lipase spread over a day. Now, we assess by day rather than by meal. Um, and again, this is where the dietitian comes in with this. We all have different meal patterns. So a, a meal dose for enzyme and a snack dose for me is not going to be the same as a meal dose and a snack dose for somebody who has a more regular dietary intake. So we assess our amount of uh, lipase over a day period rather than um, over a meal because we've got some patients on little and often and we've got some patients having three meals a day we've got some patients having one meal and a few cans of beer a day so the dose is going to, to vary considerably but the take home from this um, is the dose variation across the patients was significant with the same disease the same operation with a stable nutritional status there is no one dose for these patients um, and it doesn't appear to be food uh, specific either. So we can have a, one patient who has a massive portion of lasagna and chips and needs 75,000 units of lipase with it. We have another patient with the same disease, the same operation, same body size, who'll have the same meal and they'll need 150,000 units of lipase with it. There are huge numbers of variations and we think most of that is related to the rest of the GI um, function throughout the gut and how it's compensated or not. Um, and down to little things as to how well you chew your food, how hot your food is when you eat it, whether you're on a PPI or not, um, whether uh, you drink a lot of fluid with your meals. There are all sorts of things that are going to affect pancreatic enzymes. So we do have starting doses, though. 
Um, and the minimum starting dose for us in our unit is 50,000 units with a meal and 25 with a snack. Um, we always remind our GPs particularly about uh, nutritional supplements because a lot of them will merrily start their supplement drinks in the community and forget to give enzymes with them. Everybody asks me how much to give with a supplement. Again, it varies on the supplement. If you're giving a 300 calorie bottle and 300 calories is normally a snack for that patient, then we give them a snack dose. If they're having a 570 calorie supplement, um, then we give them a meal dose. So it varies accordingly. But the important thing with it all is you start and then you review and you work up if it's not enough. Enzymes work very quickly. You should see a change in symptoms in two or three days. The only time you see a delay in that is if the patient's had profuse osmotic diarrhea due to malabsorption. It's taking a while to slow the bowel down. And sometimes you can use loperamide and codeine to help do that. But you should see an improvement quite quickly. There are some differential diagnoses. Bile acid malabsorption. Um, it's really common in patients with pancreatic exocrine insufficiency. When you have a Whipple resection, the gallbladder is resected as well. Bile salts bind to maldigested proteins, carbohydrates, and fiber. So if you've got malabsorption going on, um, you'll bind those bile acids and you're more likely to have bile acid malabsorption. We've got that change in the pH we mentioned. Um, and there are studies showing significant bile losses um, in, the, in the colon in, um, in children with cystic fibrosis. So we know the mechanism is there in pancreatic exocrine insufficiency. But there is very old data, very little data um, in this patient group. Bacterial overgrowth, more recent data on that, and documented in nearly in between 25 and 50 percent of patients with exocrine insufficiency. And that can precipitate further bile acid malabsorption. So often you'll see all three of these things together. Um, this study from 2009 proposed that enzymes may normalize the small bowel conditions and avoid bacterial overgrowth. Um, and those patients who've had surgery are at much higher risk than those with chronic pancreatitis alone. Um, and again, we think that's because we've got this blind loop of bowel that no food is going through and it's, it's prime for, uh, for bacterial overgrowth. All of these things contribute to bowel symptoms and again, make these patients more difficult to manage. Also, drugs like octreotide are used or langreotide, um, sandostatin uh, medications that all inhibit secretions throughout the gut, and that includes pancreatic secretions. And often these drugs are used for non-pancreatic diseases, so neuroendocrine tumours, for instance. Um, sometimes you see them in short bowel. Um, opiates, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, I work for a surgical team, so we like to blame everything on oncology. Um, but the operation itself causes delayed gastric emptying or dumping syndrome, depending on the type of operation that we see. And sometimes our patients can have more than one thing wrong with them, which is something we strongly believe should not be allowed. Um, we see a lot of intestinal inflammation. Um, uh, we have patients who develop um, colitis, Crohn's disease, celiac disease, lactase deficiency and functional bowel disorders. So we're putting them through probably one of the most stressful things in their life and we expect them to react. Well, we don't expect them to react. Um, so a lot of patients are under a huge amount of stress, um, and that can trigger other bowel symptoms as well. So lots of other things. And sometimes they simply just aren't eating. And actually, the more we delve into the complexities of these patients, sometimes the more we forget the basics. Um, so if you Google diet for pancreatic cancer, you will still get low-fat diets. Um, we don't need low-fat diets anymore. Low-fat diets were brought in when we didn't have pancreatic enzymes and we were trying to manage steatorrhea um, in terms of reducing symptoms. It's really important when you've got a patient with malabsorption, if they go on a low-fat diet, all you lose is the symptoms of malabsorption. You're not correcting the malabsorption. You just can't see it anymore. Okay? Um, so we get a huge number of patients referred in. No, 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 I don't have malabsorption. I don't have yellow stools. I don't have diarrhea. Oh, I do have a bit of bloating. I have lost a lot of weight. You do have malabsorption. We just can't see it easily. We see a lot of early satiety, nausea, fear of eating, fear of diarrhea. Um, so we very often see patients who won't eat because the diarrhea symptoms are so severe. They're scared of going out of the house. And they have to go out of the house. They've got to go to work. They've got to take their kids to school. So therefore, they don't eat. Pain, inappropriate dietary advice. Um, usually care of Dr. Google, um, and constipation. 
Um, as Keith mentioned earlier on, patients worry about constipation. Our patients have huge reasons to be constipated. Um, what starting enzymes will do is result, return their bowel function to what it would be normally, hopefully. That's what we aim for it to be doing. And we get a number of patients who come in, they're complaining they've reduced their enzymes because they've got constipated. We take a bowel history from them. They've had constipation dominant IBS their entire life. It's not going to be any different now they've got pancreatic cancer. We have to manage the constipation in the same way we always would do. Um, and we write a lot, particularly to primary care, um, to remind GPs that constipation should not be managed by inducing malabsorption. Okay? Because that's what happens. If their creon constipates them, they reduce their creon. They're malabsorbing, but they're not constipated anymore. Okay. So, practically, it's really important that enzyme prescriptions are given with meals, snacks, and nutritional supplements. And we still see patients who take them once a day or three times a day, but they eat five times a day, or have been prescribed build-up or Complan or Fortisip and not been given any with that. Um, a regular review of enzymes alongside normal dietary intake. Um, part of the problem we have with the post-op patients is the point they go home, they're not eating normally. Their gut's still settling down after an operation. They may have only had their bowels open once, particularly now we've got enhanced recovery running in these patients. We send them home remarkably early. Um, so at the point they're eating, that's, that's not normal diet for them. That's a post-operative day five, day six diet. That's not normal. So they may not be exhibiting symptoms at that stage, but in a few weeks' time when they're eating a bit better, the chances are they are. And that's where it's really, really important to remember that a patient with symptoms is a patient with malabsorption, but a patient without symptoms may still have malabsorption. We just can't see it. There's a very old paper that shows... Um, um, uh, a Cagliari paper which showed uh, patients can malabsorb up to 55 grams of fat a day, that's 500 calories, give or take, with absolutely no abdominal symptoms at all. Um, so we shouldn't assume that just because the patient doesn't have symptoms, it's not happening. Um, we need to consider constipation as a masking factor and remember that pancreatic exocrine insufficiency will change over time. The remaining pancreas will atrophy over time. Um, the patients get disease reoccurrence, so you have a change in the dietary intake. Um, enzymes are heat sensitive, um, so if they get too hot, uh, they won't work. Um, so when we very rarely have hot temperatures in the UK, um, we have had problems, particularly when they're left in cars and it gets very hot and stuffy in there. Pancreatic enzymes, dependent on the product, need to be stored usually below 25 degrees. Um, again, rarely a problem in the UK, but occasionally it happens um, and it does catch patients out sometimes. It's really important that unresolved or new GI symptoms are investigated because it might not be exocrine insufficiency. Um, and other things like disease reoccurrence uh, need to be excluded as well as other GI pathology. So it's, it's, there's more to it than just upping the enzymes each time, and that's really important. So I'm just going to touch on some of the research looking into palliative care at the moment um, and how we manage these patients. So this is a post-Whipple uh, diagram. So the distal stomach's been removed. Um, the, jeg the duodenum's gone. The head of the pancreas is gone. The um, external bile ducts have gone. The gallbladder's gone. Okay? So the jejunum is brought up here. This is the blind loop I mentioned earlier on. So this is usually about 30 centimetres long and the tail of the pancreas is plumbed onto it and the bile ducts, from, so the liver sits here, the liver are plumbed onto it as well. So what I meant when I said about asynchrony of delivery earlier on is food comes in, it goes down this way and into the rest of the bowel and then the enzymes in the bowel trundle along here and they try and catch up. So that's what we mean by asynchrony of delivery. Um, normally... They'd merge as they're excreted at the ampulla. They'd mix with food as it goes past. So we don't have good mixing. We get a lot of patients referred in with query disease progression. Um, and these are all the other things that it can be. We see delayed gastric emptying. We see dumping syndrome. We see benign stricturing at the, new, at the join here, what we call the gastrojejunostomy, um, which can tighten over time. Um, you can get tumor infiltration there. So we're not denying some patients do have disease reoccurrence. Uh, the tumour can infiltrate uh, the blood vessels and affect mesenteric blood flow. So you can get things like mesenteric angina type symptoms. Uh, chemotherapy related diarrhoea. I don't see too much of that with the new regimes, but it is possible. Uh, use of octreotide and sandostatin inhibits remaining pancreas and, and bile flow. Um, if you get stricturing around that pancreatic duct, um, then you see you can get post-operative pancreatitis, so new onset abdominal pains, nausea and vomiting. 
Exocrine insufficiency is, as we know, this is the limb that's prone to bacterial overgrowth. And you can get something called afferent loop syndrome, which is a stasis or worse reversal of flow in that limb. And this is where this anatomy is really important for dietitians to be aware of. Um, if you've got a patient with delayed gastric emptying after a whipple, they need to go back for their to their specialist centre to have an NJ tube inserted. An NJ tube should not be inserted routinely um, uh, in, in normal DGH environments in a patient who's had a whipple because there is a real risk of putting the tube down the wrong limb. And if you do that and you feed down there, it's a dead end and it can be catastrophic. Um, so you need somebody who, uh, an endoscopist who is really familiar with this anatomy to place any NJ tubes in these patients. Um, I use core track um, and I would not core track a patient with this anatomy because I've got no way of knowing where I'm going. Um, so we often do a combined endoscopic and radiological procedure um, with some contrast to make sure we're in the right place for this. But even so, we have six people who put NJ tubes down in our hospital and we only allow three of them to do it with the Whipples um, because putting it down the wrong way um, could, be, could be absolutely disastrous. So we see bile acid malabsorption and you can also see postoperative cholangitis as well, again, if that stricture gets small. All of those things can cause altered bowel symptoms which is what makes our job so much fun. Okay. So when it comes to managing pancreatic cancer in the palliative care setting, um, historically it was assumed that pancreatic cancer patients will lose weight. Um, the very first study day I went to when I qualified, I was told that enteral nutrition is never indicated in pancreatic cancer. I'm going to show you a case study in a minute that shows you that's not the case. And the very first patient I managed as a senior two um, on a gastro rotation um, I couldn't get weight on, and my supervisor at the time told me that patients had, could have leaky bucket syndrome, where it didn't matter how much I put into them, I was never going to fill the bucket up. And our focus dietetically was on managing expectations and minimising the effect on quality of life. And I'm going to show you some data now that I hope will remove some of those uh, historical um, perceptions. So this is data from Australia, from the Cancer Cachexia study group there. They took 107 patients who were losing weight. Um, so then these were patients with unresectable pancreatic cancer, and they were losing a loss of weight, 17% median weight loss um, prior to survival. And they in provided intensive nutritional intervention, weekly phone calls, supplements, they monitored anthropometrics, they uh, adjusted enzyme doses, and survival increased from 164 days to 259 days in the patients who, for whom they were able to achieve weight stabilization. And all those patients who were weight stable documented improved quality of life. Okay. So this is a German study of 100 patients um, looking at patients who had neoadjuvant chemo radiation, um, so locally advanced pancreatic cancer. And they divided survival up um, measured against weight loss. Um, and the patients who lost the least amount of weight, less than 2.5%, had a much higher survival than those who had lost more than 10% of their body weight, which makes sense. What we didn't know at this stage was whether this is a chicken and egg situation. Do the patients who have the best, better prognosis disease eat better and have less weight loss? Um, or do those patients who eat better and have uh, less weight loss more, uh, more um, likely to continue with their uh, oncological treatment, more likely to have more chemotherapy? So there's a little bit of a chicken and egg. What's really interesting with this, these are locally advanced patients with pancreatic cancer. Can you see all of these survivals? This is two years. This is nearly four years. So huge amounts of survival possible. Um, uh, and okay, they're the extremes of the groups, um, but you're looking at nearly a year um, in some of these patients. 14% of these patients have parenteral nutrition through their chemotherapy. We don't do that in the UK. Okay. So... This led on to this study. This is a phase two trial, again, carried out in Germany, 32 patients, and took patients with advanced pancreatic cancer. They all had a BMI less than 19. They were all losing more than 5% of their body weight in a four-week period, despite enteral, and it classifies as enteral, but it's actually oral um, nutritional support. So they're losing more than 5% of the body weight every month. Okay? So these patients in the UK would be referred to palliative care, we wouldn't be doing anything very aggressive with them. The treatment in Germany includes the use of steroids, antiemetics, prokinetics, and cannabinoids, uh, which are legal and prescribable in Germany, and obviously not here. 
They gave these patients overnight parenteral nutrition, five nights out of seven at home. So these are patients we would be referring probably for hospice care. Less than 10% of them continued to lose weight. Okay, so three patients out of 32 continued to lose weight on parenteral nutrition. The remaining 29 patients gained weight. Okay, and the quality of life data is good in that as well. There's not enough patients to draw survival data from. Now, I'm not saying patients with advanced pancreatic cancer should have parenteral nutrition, but if parenteral nutrition can reverse some of the malnutrition, then maybe we're not doing oral nutrition correct. Do you see what I mean? Okay. So, this trial at the moment is an open-label randomised multi-centre phase three, comparing parenteral nutrition versus best supportive nutritional care in patients receiving um, uh, uh, first or second line chemotherapy. Um, now, uh, we've been watching this trial with great interest. It opened in 2009, it closed in 2014, and they still haven't published their results. And we check every month, um, because this could be really exciting for us, because this is what we've been needing for. This is a proper randomized trial in these patients. So we'll remove that chicken and egg debate um, across the board. Okay. So to conclude this part, um, our incidences are variable. Um, but approximately 12% after a central pancreatectomy, round about 20% after a distal pancreatectomy. Pre-operatively, up to 40%, 45% for a Whipple's resection, and post-operatively, anything up to 98%. Now, this isn't going to tell you which patients have exocrine insufficiency or not, but hopefully, it's going to tell you that we should be looking for it in all of them, because there is a significant incidence in all patient groups. There is a general consensus that patients should have enzymes following pancreatic duodenectomy, full stop. Um, and certainly in our centre, that's what we do, um, and a number of other centres around the UK as well. We assess our distal and central pancreatectomies individually, but we have a very low threshold for starting it, seeing how they get on, and then reviewing it six months down the line to see whether we need it or not, rather than wait until they become profoundly malnourished. There are multiple causes of malabsorption in this patient group and they need regular review and individualised advice. With regard to palliative patients, there is the question as to whether we should be considering more aggressive nutrition support. And certainly we have a number of patients who have undertaken quite intensive nutrition support and done really well at it, who are weight stable, who are weight gaining, um, who previously would be considered not appropriate for aggressive nutritional support. The big thing with it is it's not just the nutritional markers that go up, it's the quality of life that goes up. And that's what we need to be really, really, uh, really stressing. Thank you. Thank you.